Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm Bob Wachter, Chair of the Department of Medicine. This is a very special Grand Rounds. Uh, every year, many of our divisions sponsor or co-sponsor with the department a Grand Rounds uh, uh, bringing here a luminary in the specialty, and often the Grand Rounds are named for, for one of our uh, prominent faculty members who made a tremendous contribution, and that is the case here. This is the, uh, the Cardos Lecture. Uh, Gary Cardos was a, an esteemed uh, clinician educator on our faculty for many years. Gary had been a medical student at UCSF resident, chief resident at UCSF. I just asked Chi Shu, uh, our division chief here, uh, about did he do nephrology fellowship? And the answer is no. Back in the day, uh, people often did not do fellowships. They just started a field and learned to be an expert, and Gary clearly was that. Uh, he'd been in community practice for many years and then came back to our faculty and uh, distinguished himself as a doctor and a teacher, and I think uh, his family may be joining us online. So uh, thank you to them. And uh, this is a nice opportunity to honor uh, Gary's uh, memory and his many contributions to our department. Uh, this year, uh, we're thrilled to have an old friend return uh, to be the Cardos professor. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Kirsten Johansson, who is a professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota, chief of nephrology at Hennepin, uh, healthcare, uh, director of the United States Renal Data System, and president of the Hennepin Healthcare Research Institute. She must have a very large business card. Uh, Kirsten graduated from Duke uh, Medical School, uh, did her uh, internal medicine training at MGH, and did come uh, do a nephrology fellowship, and in fact did it here, and uh, stayed on our, uh, our faculty for uh, many years where she distinguished herself as a fantastic uh, clinician, teacher, and a national and internationally known uh, researcher in uh, nephrology, specializing in the care of patients with chronic kidney disease and, uh, and different ways of thinking about how to deliver uh, appropriate care for patients with, uh, with severe kidney disease. Uh, we were sad to lose her to Minnesota several years ago, but this is an outstanding opportunity, and she's continued her trajectory of being a, uh, a, a superb leader in the field of nephrology. Uh, we're thrilled that she's come back to visit us, and her talk today will be uh, entitled The Devastating Effect of COVID-19 on Patients with End-Stage uh, Kidney Disease. Kirsten, welcome back. Thank you for that kind introduction. It's really been a pleasure to be back. I've been here for a couple of days, um, seeing a lot of old friends and colleagues. Um, it's also... Um, really especially an honor to be invited to give this lecture because I worked with Dr. Cardos when he was here. He um, did uh, much of his clinical work at the VA where I was, and he was um, uh, an amazing uh, colleague to have. He was so knowledgeable, so kind. He was such a good teacher for the fellows. He was really a favorite. Um, so I'm, I'm really um, honored to be back here giving this lecture. Right, now we're going to see if the slides advance. Yay. <laughs> uh, I had a little trouble the other day, but it uh, seems to be working now. So these are my disclosures. Um, and we'll get started. So um, you saw the title of the talk. Um, it's going, I'm going to just take you through some work that we did, mostly things that we've done as the USRDS. And don't worry, before I do that, I'll explain what the USRDS is is because I think there are some non-nephrologists in the room. Um, but uh, some, of the, some of the registry work from us and CDC and others uh, picked up even the attention of some of the lay press um, who were uh, pretty stunned by some of uh, the outcomes, unfortunately. Yep, so anyway, this is, this is a little bit about the AIM. So I'll just tell you a little bit about what the US RD, RDS is, and then we'll look at the impact of COVID-19 on the ESRD and CKD populations. Um, and then we'll look, uh, we'll look in general, and then we'll look at some differences based on treatment modality and race and ethnicity. Um, and then briefly, we'll talk about how, how that translates to policy. So just a little bit of history. In 1972, um, the uh, government passed a, a law, the National End Stage renal, uh, creating the National End Stage Renal Disease Program so that uh, anyone who developed end stage kidney disease who was eligible for Social Security otherwise 
would be designated as disabled and would be eligible for um, coverage for their ESRD through Medicare. And at the time, I think um, that there was a thought that there were only a few patients who were gonna need dialysis. This wasn't gonna have a major impact on the, on the budget or the population, but that isn't really how it transpired as I'm sure you know. Um, so in 1986, um, they passed another law and part of the, one of the Budget Reconciliation Acts mandating the creation of a registry of end-stage renal disease because of concerns about mortality in this population, high mortality, and also high cost of caring for them. Uh, and so 1988, I think, is when the USRDS was fully established, funded by NIH through a competitive contract mechanism. Uh, and it has five goals listed here, um, although to me they're sort of overlapping, um, but mainly to characterize the ESRD population was initially the case. It's actually expanded to include CKD not with ESRD as well, describing incidents, the prevalence uh, and trends in mortality, as well as um, relationships between demographics, treatment modalities, and mor morbidity. Um, and then cost, I mentioned they were concerned about cost. And then last identifying new areas for special studies and supporting investigator-initiated research. Um, that's the general USRDS. And so, as I mentioned, it's funded through uh, NIH. Um, and just in the last few years, uh, it's been folded into the NIH website there. Um, and we run that jointly with them. We run some of it. They run some of it in the background. Not that you need to know that. Um, this is just a simplified diagram, a little bit of how we how we get the data and how we build it. So we get data from currently what's called EQRS, ESRD Quality Reporting System, um, and then OPTN, the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network for transplant. We get data identifying patients with end-stage kidney disease and transplant, and we get their specific identifiers. We then create a finder file in order to get CMS claims, fee-for-service and Medicare Advantage um, for those patients and, and then build a database from there. At the same time, as I said, we expanded, not we, but before my time, expanded to CKD as well. So among Medicare beneficiaries, we also create uh, CKD files and we um, get Medicare claims for them and, and more recently Medicaid claims as well to try to describe the younger CKD population as well as the older ones who previously qualified for Medicare. And then that information is used to fulfill these various functions on the right. Um, the annual data report is one of the biggest things that, that we do um, providing the data that I was, you saw with the five things, incidents and the prevalence and the mortality and then the characteristics of the patients. And that goes, um, used to be a book that was actually printed. It's now online, but it's used by, we hope it's used by researchers, poly, policymakers and the whole community. I won't go through the list of all of the other things here, but um, in the interest of time. Um, so um, as I mentioned, um, we typically use CMS data as the backbone of what we do. It's not all of what we do, but it's the backbone. Um, we, we at uh, CDRG at, at Hennepin um, got the contract in 2019. And so 2020 was our first year getting all of this data and creating the annual data report. Um, and typically that would have included data through 2018 because there's actually a lag in getting Medicare data, you can't even apply to get it until uh, almost the end of the year. And then in any case, we would have normally under normal circumstances expected for a report that we were gonna publish in December to have data going through 2018. But then as you all know, 2020 was not a normal typical year. And we really thought that it would be important for USRDS as the ESRD registry in the country to try to do whatever possible to try to document what was happening. Unfortunately, our NIDDK colleagues were just as interested in that as well. And were able to, to support um, getting additional data because CMS does make quarterly uh, data available. They're just, 
additional time, effort, costs to do that. But uh, we worked together to do that in 2020. Um, it does come with some challenges. Um, this is a slide just showing um, successive quarterly data cuts from the EQRS and looking at the number of deaths among patients by, with ESRD by month. And what you can sort of see, my pointer working, yeah. So if you compare say the red to the gray here or the gray to the green or the green to the blue, you, what you see is that in the most recent quarter of data, there's a lot of missing because it just takes some time for that, for that information to get submitted. There's still some missing data back one quarter, but it's not nearly as much. Um, so what we did was we, we had data through the third quarter of 2020, and we didn't use the most recent quarter because of all of that missing data that I, that I just showed you. But, but for the quarter where there's some missing data, it was, it's really pretty predictably missing from, from quarter to quarter. And so we used the data that we had from successive things like I just showed you to extrapolate and apply inflation factors month by month. And I just listed these here just to show you that they were relatively small um, uh, for death, 2% uh, or less. Um, and for some of the other outcomes still all less than 5%. And so when we did that, this is what we found. Um, we found a lot of COVID mortality, which I'm sure, uh, sorry, hospital hospitalization, which I'm sure is not surprising to you. This is just looking at hospitalization um, by um, epidemiologic week. And I think people weren't very familiar with this a long time ago, but when COVID happened, you probably all have seen many, many graphs, but it goes from Sunday to Saturday. And the CDC uses this a lot to track outbreaks and things. And so there was no COVID until around March and then and then unfortunately there was. And so a large amount of hospitalization, particularly the blue line there is hemodialysis, patients treated with hemodialysis uh, had a lot more uh, hospitalization than those on peritoneal dialysis. And these are rates. So this is per thousand patients. So it's not just that this is because there are fewer patients on peritoneal dialysis, it's that they had lower rates of infection. So we wanted to delve in. So that was what we were able to show in 2020. Moving forward, we've looked, we've gotten, of course, more recent data, and we've been able to delve into it a little bit more. And so this is showing some, some work that we did to try to figure that out. So why was the hemodialysis patient population affected so much more than the PD population? And, and to what extent was that related to nursing home exposure because of the nursing home outbreaks that we saw. So we, we broke them into five groups. So um, the, in, the in-facility hemodialysis patients, we broke them into those who had no history of recent SNF exposure, those who, were, who had had current or recent within the last 60 days uh, exposure to a nursing home, or those who were actually in a facility, a nursing skilled facility, and receiving their dialysis actually there rather than transporting to a center. And then the patients who are receiving hemodialysis at home or PD at home. And so the top uh, graph here is looking at, so and then we looked at COVID diagnoses and hospitalizations and death. Um, and so the top one, the black line is the uh, in, is hemo, in, hemodialysis anywhere but home. So the top three of these groups here, and then the red line and the blue line are the home dialysis patients. So just kind of confirming what I showed you on the previous slide that those who are dialysing at home, whether it's hemo or PD, so it doesn't seem to be hemodialysis per se, but rather hemodialysis that's not happening in your home was associated with higher rates of infection, of diagnosis, I should say. And then the bottom one is looking at this black line on the bottom it is um, in-center hemodialysis uh, without COVID uh, nursing home exposure. And then the blue, uh, the green, I believe, is in a nursing facility and the purple is um, in a nursing facility, but traveling to dialysis or recently having done so. And so what you can see is that the nursing home exposure really um, really had a big effect on the number of diagnosed cases and um, 
Interestingly, in the very first wave, those who were receiving care in the dialysis in the SNFs had the highest rates, and that actually kind of flipped with the ones that were traveling to dialysis um, in the second little wave in 2020 there. Um, now, and it's possible, we don't really know why this is. I mean, one possibility, since this is COVID diagnosis, could just be more testing. There was testing that was going on in SNFs and in dialysis facilities. So we don't know that they actually, I, I misspoke when I said cases and not diagnoses. Um, however, unfortunately, we saw some of the same patterns with hospitalization and mortality. This is hospitalization on the left and mortality on the right. And so I don't think that would have been so dependent on testing and case findings. So unfortunately, it does look like this was very real um, and may have been related to being cohorted with people in nursing facilities, traveling to and from and perhaps shared vans and other things as opposed to being able to shelter at home. Uh, and this is just a busy table to sort of show that when you do a multivariable analysis, it all still panned out that, uh, you know, that SNF exposure, especially in that very first uh, wave, you know, the rates were 10 to 13 times higher, uh, and then rates at home were about half. And that did attenuate as the uh, pandemic went on. Um, and so putting that together, this is just, this is a plot of the cumulative incidence of, um, of COVID diagnosis in 2020. And the red is CKD, the green is transplant and the gray is dialysis. And so uh, these dialysis patients just had much higher cumulative rates. By the end of 2020, 16% of everyone who had been on dialysis had had COVID at least once, had been diagnosed with COVID at least once. Um, this is looking at hospitalization. We wanted to look at um, differences by race and ethnicity, which we were seeing in the general population, um, as you know. And so on the left is looking by race. So the, the red line is um, black patients and the other two lines are white and other. And you can see that especially early on, there was a much bigger, um, bigger, much higher rate of hospitalization among the black patients. Uh, on the right, at this time, we've changed to a combined race ethnicity, but at this time we were doing them separately. So on the right is Hispanic versus not Hispanic and the blue is Hispanic. And so early on, they were pretty similar Hispanic and non-Hispanic, but it, as the year wore on, we started to separate with a higher, uh, higher incidence of COVID hospitalization in the Hispanic population. This is a little bit busy, but, um, but I wanted to show this as this is a multivariable analysis, kind of delving into that a little bit more. And this is looking at uh, rates of COVID-19 hospitalization in three different periods, the first wave, the, the sort of middle, and then later in the year in 2020. And so the black, the, the open circles are the first, first three, couple of months. The asterisks are the middle, and then the the black dots are the later period. Um, and if you just look at age to sort of see if we can orient ourselves, what you can see is that early in the pandemic, let's see if I can point this out, early in the pandemic, older patients were at much higher risk. But as it came, as, as it went forward, they came down in their risk and younger patients here who had been much lower risk um, were still lower risk, but, uh, but they're but not as much as they had been as things went on. And with race and ethnicity, what you see here is that um, black patients were um, higher uh, the entire time, uh, and so were Hispanics. So those curves looked like they were superimposed before at the beginning. Um, but I think that's because unfortunately, um, Hispanic patients who are on dialysis tend to be quite a bit younger. Um, than others. And so when you adjust for that, what you actually see is that even in that first wave, pe Hispanic people did have a higher rate, but it did get worse. It did get worse as the year went by, uh, their relative rates uh, did get higher. 
And then um, here down at the bottom is looking at modality. So again, just the same as what I showed you before, which is that um, patient stylizing at home consistently had a lower risk. Um, so when we started doing it early, you know, we were in such a rush to get the data and um, get everything cranked out that it was, we, our focus was really on the dialysis and to a lesser extent, the CKD population. But then of course the question is, well, how does this compare to the general population? So I showed you things comparing within groups of kidney disease patients, but once we caught our breaths after the report was in, we started delving into that a little bit more and using data in the general population. So this is uh, this COVID net surveillance area that the CDC had. And so we use this to get the population um, rates of hospitalization. And this is a slide showing that. So there were 14 states. Um, this one right here is California. And this one right here is Minnesota. We were both in the, in the network. Um, I just put these here to sort of show you that um, rates in the dialysis population tended to track with, excuse me, with the rates. They were actually quite correlated. I'll put this bigger. This is this one is the composite of all the states. Um, so they, there was a pretty tight correlation across states. It was 0.9 overall, and it was between it was 0.5 and 0.95 depending on the state. Um, but we superimpose these curves so that you could see that they're correlated. But what I really wanna make sure you can see is that the scales are completely different. So the scale on the left, uh, scale on the right is for the general population and that's admissions per 100,000 population. On the left is the scale for dialysis patients and that's per thousand, per 1,000 patients. So actually the rates in the dialysis population were about 40 times higher than the general population. So highly correlated with trends in the population with infection rates, but 40 times higher. Um, and this is just really kind of showing the same thing in a different way. Uh, the non-CKD population is the red line at the bottom. And then, Gray is CKD and whatever color that is in the middle is transplant. And then the green is the dialysis population. And so this is just turning to mortality. Sadly, the natural consequence of having COVID bad enough to be hospitalized is mortality. Um, and again, this was fairly early on. Uh, this is looking at Mortality by week, and the green line is 2020, uh, and the other lines are the years before that, 2017, 18, and 19. And so normally, mortality in the dialysis population follows a pretty predictable uh, yearly um, cycle where deaths are higher at the beginning of the year due to respiratory viruses and things like that. They come down in the summer before rising up again a little bit in the fall. And that's what they were on trajectory to do up until March happened. And then we saw this big blip. And this is mortality from all causes, but it was just such a large increase that it's very visible in the data. And on the right is the transplant population that has much lower rates of mortality overall in general, but still experienced a, a big bump up in 2020. Um, and this, and this was, this is looking, so that was all cause mortality in the general population, but trying to get at, well, you know, how much of that is COVID and what is the actual COVID mortality? What percentage of people with COVID are actually dying? So, um, so that's what this is. This is looking at still all cause mortality, but after a COVID diagnosis. So within 14 days, 30 days, or 90 days of a COVID diagnosis among people with no CKD in blue, CKD in red, dialysis in gray, and transplant in the green. And so, you know, it, it, what you can see is that First of all, as with everything I've been showing you today, it, everything is higher in the people who have CKD and especially end-stage kidney disease. Um, but you know, over 30, around 30% 30 of people with ESRD who got COVID 
um, died within 30 days um, during this period. And that's just something that I at least had not appreciated until we, we did this. Um, it just really was pretty devastating. And it's even a little higher if you go out to 90 days. Um, and then, therefore, again, I already sort of did show you the overall mortality. This is just a different way of looking at it. Instead of weekly, this is cumulative. So on the left is dialysis and on the right is transplant. And so the blue and the red are previous years, 2019, 2018. And then the gray, I think, is 2020. Mortality overall was 18% higher in 2020, cumulative mortality for dialysis patients. And, and about the same, maybe even a little higher, more like 20, 22% higher in transplant. And then the green line is actually into 2021. We were able to track that a little bit farther uh, and it stayed high. It stayed high for dialysis and even may have gone up further. And I'll show you something on that in the transplant population. Ah, good, I, I changed the order of my slides so that I could do that right now. Um, so this is even more, this is more recent data uh, going out all the way to the end of 2021. Um, we had seen that cumulative mortality curve and we were a little bit worried. Um, and I, I'm more worried now that we've seen this. So this is dialysis that I've been showing you and then the red is transplant. Um, but what happened is that at the end of 2021, the transplant patients surpassed the dialysis patients in terms of COVID hospitalization rates. And I don't know why this is, I, but I, I, some concerns are that it could be um, either that vaccines, vaccines came up on board and we'll talk a little bit about that. And so, and especially hemodialysis patients were able to get them in dialysis. But I think transplant centers were pretty aggressive about vaccinating people too. But we have a lot of data that they didn't always have as vigorous a response to the vaccine as um, the general population and even as dialysis patients. So this is a bit of a concern that our transplant patients, the world is opening back up again. They're not able to shelter at home. And um, we saw at least at the end of 2021, those rates cross. We'll, we'll certainly be following that again this year when we get the data. Um, this is just another way of looking at it. Um, this is across years now from 2011 onwards to 2021 with um, transplant on the bottom and dialysis on the top. Just to sort of show that the mortality rates jumped up in dialysis and they didn't come back down, but they kind of flattened. Whereas in the transplant population, they continued to rise in 2021. So sort of just another way of looking at that um, phenomenon. Um, I promised I'd talk a little bit about policy. So um, in Minnesota, we had the opportunity to talk with the Minnesota Department of Health and the governor's task force on um, vaccine distribution in um, or it, the end of 2020. Um, they really wanted to prioritize getting vaccines to the, to the most vulnerable people, the people most likely to have bad outcomes from COVID. And they also wanted to prioritize um, equity um, in access to the to transplant um, and equity, particularly racial and ethnic um, among racial and ethnic groups. Um, but they didn't have CKD and ESRD on their list of particularly vulnerable people. They had hypertension and obesity and some other conditions, but um, CKD and especially ESRD hadn't been highlighted. Um, but we got an opportunity to present some of the data that I showed you early on about the fact that this patient is extremely vulnerable medically and the fact that there were clear racial and ethnic disparities in who was getting COVID, getting hospitalized with it, dying from it. <clears throat> and as a result, they made the decision to start giving COVID vaccines to dialysis pa patients and to staff um, in, in the dialysis facilities. Because the other thing is that it's really difficult for these patients to all have to come one by one into medical offices when they're already coming three times a week to a dialysis center. So that started in January, 2021 um, in Minnesota. And then the Biden administration um, adopted that policy as well in April, I believe of that year. So, um, so I think data from USRDS and CDC and, and others um, was really telling and really at least um, 
got that coverage for our patients. Um, I'm gonna just turn to a different, something different. So all of this death and, and, um, uh, and hospitalization led to a reduction for the first time that we had ever seen in the prevalent ESRD population. Um, so this slide is showing on the top dialysis um, and just projecting that the dotted lines are the, are the model data, what was happening and that what was expected to have happened in 2021. And the bottom is the same thing for transplant population. Um, and especially in dialysis, you could just see the amazing way that this curve fell off from where it was expected to have gone. Same thing happened for transplant patients, but to a little bit of a lesser extent. Um, I do think that mortality was, you know, probably the biggest driver of that. But interestingly, we also saw less lower rates of incident ESRD during that time. Um, so that's what this is. Um, the, the gray, red, and blue lines are the previous years, 2017, 18, 19, as we've had before. And this is just week by week, how many people are starting treatment for end-stage kidney disease. And you know it's a little messy because it's week by week data, but you know, they were all following the same trend until 2020. And there was this really big dip um, in the number of patients actually starting uh, treatment for ESRD in 2020. Um, <clears throat> and this is looking at it with some adjustment. And um, on the left, <clears throat> excuse me, is showing by modality. So the gray is transplant. Um, the blue, I think it's blue, is hemodialysis. And the red is home, is home peritoneal dialysis. So they all dropped down. Uh, but transplant initially dropped down the most. That actually rebounded and it rebounded pretty quickly and it rebounded back to normal. You kind of can't tell because we've cut this off at an early time point. But the dialysis um, numbers didn't level out at least through the end of 2020 and even some into 2021. It is interesting to note that the in-center hemodialysis numbers dropped the most. Um, and we wondered whether people were really realizing that if they could dialyze at home, that might be safer. Um, but it's hard to know what, what anyone, doctors or patients were thinking at the time. The other thing that we noticed in, on the right is just the, um, the EGFR at the time of dialysis initiation actually dropped as well. So people were starting dialysis at a lower EGFR compared to prior years. So the dotted line is what was happening prior years. Um, you know, and this is about a difference of almost 0.4. And that might not sound like a lot, but it actually is. I just put this context here. I mean, that's, that's what had happened. It, it had been dropping slightly since 2011 because of data that shows that starting dialysis earlier doesn't help patients. Um, but it had dropped about the same amount over about a five-year period. And now this happened within months. Um, so that's the context there. I think that's a giant effect actually. Um, and we're, we're following, it looks like that has also gone back up, but maybe not back to baseline. We'll have to stay tuned for when we get 2022 data. Um, um, this is just, this is looking sort of what I was saying before, which is that it did go back up. This is overall number of patients starting treatment for ESRD and the dip down there is 2020. And then it did dip, go back up again in 2021. It didn't reach up to where it would have been projected to go, but it did increase back towards normal. And of course, one thing that we wonder and why we'll be continuing to follow this drop off and this number of patients coming in is that you know, one reason why it may not have rebounded back despite the fact that not as many people started is perhaps some of those patients, mortality was high in CKD as well. And I showed you those figures where mortality and hospitalization and all of those things were lower for people with CKD than ESRD. Um, 
But anytime you look at outcomes among CKD patients, you're mostly looking at stage three. Um, the stage four and five becomes an ever smaller part of the population. Those are the patients who would have been likely to be nearing dialysis and likely had even higher mortality. So that is something we're still also tracking. You know, to what extent will the population rebound versus to what extent was just higher mortality even in the later stages of CKD gonna delay that or eliminate that full rebound? Um, prevalence didn't uh, rebound. So I, what I was showing you before was incident, new people coming on to dialysis. But in terms of prevalent dialysis, it pretty much just stayed flat. It has not rebounded as of the end of 2021. And that's driven um, in the prevalence I already told you was still down, uh, oh, was down overall. This is number and this is rate. Um, so as a rate, it actually even decreased further. Um, and that was driven mainly by a decrease in the in-center hemodialysis population, which is the top line. That population is continuing to decline, even though transplant, which is the green line, is continuing now back on its upward trajectory. And the gray line, it's a little harder to tell, but that's the peritoneal dialysis still going up slightly. So the main thing that's still going on as of the end of 2021, at least, is a decrease in the in-center hemodialysis population. Um, and this is really um, continuing to affect the dialysis population. This is not our data. This is data from the dialysis networks, ESRD networks. There's a network that tracks ESRD and other things uh, for CMS and others. Um, in any case, this is the number of dialysis facilities in the U.S. and starting with the third quarter of 2021 down to the second quarter at the end, the second quarter of 2023. And so you can see there was a little bit of a rise in general. The number of dialysis clinics has been increasing because the dialysis population and the center hemodialysis population, as I showed you before, had been increasing. But now that the population is shrinking, what's happening is dialysis facilities are actually closing. Um, and this has really been a big thing. And it's a, it's a concern because especially small rural dialysis facilities are closing. Um, and so I think that that's happening because there are fewer patients and unfortunately dialysis is a business. Um, if there aren't the patients, then they can't afford to keep them open. But there's also been, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you, issues with getting staff, nursing staff and others. So, um, so we're really starting to see now in 2023, as this data goes out, the downstream consequences of the drop in the dialysis population and going forward, we'll need to really follow what then happens to the patients as a result of these closures of the dialysis facilities and things. The other thing that's newer that we need to keep thinking about on the horizon, I think, is long COVID. Um, this is uh, showing the incidence of long COVID. The, so CMS uh, developed a code for long COVID in October 2021. Um, and so again, this is from the most recent annual data report that lags by two years. So we only have long COVID claims for four months. Um, but based on those initial four months of claims, rates were much higher in patients with kidney disease. So the left is no CKD. The next one is CKD, but not with end stage, and then dialysis and transplant. And so um, rates uh, among transplant patients were more than double the rates of people without kidney disease. Um, and so, but I think what we need to figure out is given that this was only capital claims in a four month period, I think it's really vulnerable to um, bias in the sense that people who are being seen by physicians more are going to have more claims that are going to have more diagnosis codes on them. So I won't be surprised if this attenuates a little bit with a longer period of time for everyone to accumulate diagnosis codes, but I'm not sure that a more than twofold difference is gonna go away. Um, so I think this is something we need to think about for our patient population too. And this might be 
one of the next, fr if, this, if this bears out, this might be one of the next frontiers of advocacy that we need to think about. Whatever treatments come on board, if any do, for long COVID and things like that, we may need to advocate. I actually didn't show you, I was really concerned about going over and then I talked really fast because um, I'm almost done. But um, you know, there were some disparities where kidney disease patients got uh, less remdesivir, for example, during the COVID uh, early times, even though we now at least know. I mean, some of that is legitimate. There's concern that there might be, that that might cause um, damage, but we now know that, uh, that uh, even dialysis patients can receive remdesivir. Um, and so anyway, we'll need to really make sure that if this bears out, that our patients get, get uh, included in studies and get treated for long COVID. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I'm sure I sort of hammered it into you that patients with ESRD had really significantly higher rates of COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, and unfortunately mortality, the hospitalization rates were 40 times higher. And then the already high mortality in this population went up by 18% in 2020 and was just as high in 2021. Um, 2020 showed an unprecedented decline in the total population, the prevalence of end-stage kidney disease. I often do ESRD because that's the government term. Um, and especially that was in-center hemodialysis and um, has led to closure of dialysis facilities that I think we all need to, to track as far as how that affects our patients. And more recently, we, the transplant patients are suffering higher rates of hospitalization and mortality even than dialysis. So we're gonna really need to keep our eye on that. Um, and then I just showed you that there also appears preliminarily to be more long COVID as well. So with that, I will um, end. I just want to emphasize that I do not do this work myself. Um, this is not my whole team by any stretch, um, but this is our senior, um, our senior group, and we have many analysts and others in our uh, in our shop that help us. We work with our NIDDK colleagues. We have several external collaborators, and but I really wanted to highlight especially um, that we've really enjoyed uh, working with uh, Dr. Ku and Dr. Poe here. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna get to keep working with them in this next cycle of the contract as well. So I thank you for your attention. Take any questions. Thank you, uh, Kirsten. That's incredibly interesting and sobering. Uh, let me start with a couple and, uh, and then have questions from the in-person and online audience. Uh, not intuitively obvious to me why the prevalence of CKD would go down other than, unfortunately, some people are being withdrawn from the pool because they died because of the mortality rate. But then you would think that there would be some late diagnoses during 2020. They wouldn't folks who are close to needing dialysis wouldn't get it started, that there might be a rebound. Then you would think in 21, 22, you're going to start seeing the ravages of people not getting primary care and getting their blood pressure and their diabetes treated. Uh, is that going on? And if, if, if it is, why are we not seeing that in the statistics? Yeah, thank you. That's something we've been thinking about a lot. Unfortunately, my theory is that you're right, depletion of susceptibles maybe a big part of it that that some of them did die off but um uh you know we were just talking before the grand rounds um that i should have included but i didn't because it's not it's not published yet but um but dr ku is working on on some data that we have about looking at transplant patients and we wanted to look at graft failure and what happened and also visits did they miss visits mm -hmm. did that result in more graft failure so this is a transplant population not the dialysis but um what we found is more um, total graft failure if you count death as a graft failure, but no difference in death censored graft loss. So we did not see, at least in 2020, and we go through the first half of 2022 now. Yep, she's saying yes. And um, we're not seeing that, which is reassuring. Um, I don't know, we haven't been able to look as closely yet at the CKD population. But, and it's, it's complicated to sort of model these competing things that are probably all going on at the same time. But I do have that stable of PhD people and we are thinking about that. I think that 
still doing quarterly or are you back to yearly? We're back to yearly for, um, for most things, for things that we re rely on claims. We actually are gonna start using some of that methodology that I showed you to estimate, um, to be putting quarterly counts of the incidents and prevalence up on our website um, rather than annually. So we do, we I mean, are gonna have that soon. Given the real tremendous fall off in screening and treatment of chronic diseases that seem to lead to CKD, are you surprised to not see any signal yet for a this for, I think, over two, three years, you would see something. I, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, we don't have the data yet. I didn't bore you with the data delay issues, but there are some delays in EQRS data. So I don't even know what the most recent quarterly numbers are. But um, the answer is sort of yes and no. I, um, I, I was surprised because I did think that was going to happen. Um, but, you know, I see my, my colleague, Dr. Forstetto, in the back and she knows that I think we're starting people on dialysis too early anyway. Um, so there's a tiny bit of me that is hopeful that maybe people realized, hey, look, we waited and we started them at a lower area FR and it worked out okay. And that, we, that, that we'll see practice moving a little faster than it was because it should have. We should have been decreasing based on data from 2011 and the, the change wasn't happening the way it should. So long answer, but yeah. those are my so thoughts. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask for more, then we'll open it up. Uh, the PD versus HD prevalence and risk and, and, and all that, is that just from congregate settings, from hanging out with other people, or is do you think something about, or is substrate difference, people on HD or sicker or whatever, or relatively immunosuppressed? What explains, it was a pretty profound difference in the risk. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of why we did that that analysis to try to tease that out a little, but I don't I don't think we did that successfully, so I don't want to overblow it. But if you did, if you look at the home hemo, uh, they weren't different from PD. They were not. So it looks like it's more the setting than the modality. Mm -hmm. However, home hemo isn't exactly the same as in center hemo. Some of those patients do it more frequently. Um, they I've are healthier. Those, healthier right? Yes, like they are. Right yes, they are. Um, so it, it did hold up in adjusted analyses, but it is hard to adjust for all the differences between people mm -hmm. who dialyze at home and people who don't because they're like very the, different. And also the transplant versus dialysis population. In some ways, the immunologic hit for the transplant patients would be greater, yes. and yet they're probably healthier, right? So that, Absolutely. Those things are almost balancing each other out. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. One of his handles. Got it. Uh, okay. Why don't we open it up? Uh, let's say who you are. Sure. Chishu, I'm the chief of nephrology. I just want to reflect that it hasn't been that long, frankly, since a long time ago. And behind all these numbers, I would say, there were real acts of what I thought were professionals um, and even gurus. Nephrologists volunteered to pick your certifications. Were cohorted in the last few years that only had COVID positive. Early on, there was a lot of unknowns, a lot of fear. Testament, I think, to a lot of what the doctors are studying to do. Really, I think, behind all these numbers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for the audience, I'll just um, paraphrase. So, Dr. Shu was just saying that. Um, Underneath all these numbers, sort of lost in some of the numbers, is is the sort of experience on the ground, and the courage that that some doctors really showed going into dialysis facilities when all this was going on. Including, there were facilities designated for people with known COVID who still have to get their dialysis. And um, yeah, I think I think that's true. You know, um, CMS changed their rules to allow us to do remote visits. Uh, instead of coming into those dialysis facilities. And I'm curious to know what happened here, but I, for one, never did that. Um, in theory, it was allowable, but it actually meant that dialysis staff had to bring an iPad or something to the patients and set it up. And practically speaking, that was really difficult. And so we didn't do it. We kept going to the facilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I think that was why it was so important that both the Biden administration ultimately and in Minnesota, that they, in, in the centers, they vaccinated not just the patients, but the staff. Uh, it would have been horrible, I think, to, to, to take those brave 
staff who are in there and say, well, you can't be vaccinated because you're not in this other high risk group that they de that they recognize that they were at high risk by virtue of taking care of those patients. I think that was really important. But I will point out that they were not prioritized even in UCSF in the first wave. The, the staff and- uh, No, the diocese Yeah, exactly. Although I think in many places they were, although you try to argue that like, these people are going to be to make into the close group, who also interact with other people, yeah. and they should be. So I think as we look back at policy decisions that were made, there were many that I think could have been done better. Some I think are called fair criticism, some I think are fair. Yeah. I think given the very high yeah, I, I mean, he's saying that 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 some decisions and prioritizations could have been made differently in my subtle, but I know not really subtle. That's why I was emphasizing. I mean, in Minnesota, they they listened and they did it in January. Uh, you know, vaccines came available in December, and by January it was happening, but it didn't happen till April. And the, and the and the rest of the population, and I'm sure they were pretty busy. Um, but yeah, I mean, patients died. A lot of patients died. Um, that's why I think going forward, if there's long COVID or if new, we, I, I hope we can do a better job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It took even longer at the VA to get our patients vaccinated than it did some places. Some other places. So the comment in the back was that um, at the VA, at least in San Francisco, but probably that's reflective of new nationwide, I would guess, uh, it was even slower getting the patients vaccinated in the facilities. Um, yeah, the other data, which I didn't show you guys because I was really trying to focus on COVID, but the other data that we brought to the Department of Health um, was data on influenza vaccinations because, because we've been doing that. We've been doing influenza vaccines in the dialysis facilities for years. So we brought them the data showing high rates of vaccination in the dialysis facilities showing that yes, not only, and, and then, so this shows that we have the capability, we can store the vaccines, we can do them, and then patients are getting it. Question? Question? Yeah. Um, there's a question about, do you think that the higher rate of hemodialysis uh, patients versus peritoneal dialysis is due to the fact that patients are sicker when they're on HD versus PD, or is it due to increased risk of nosocomial COVID? I, I'm, I, I, so the question is, is the higher rate in hemodialysis patients, do I think that it's because of that they are sicker uh, or is it a nosocomial effect? I, I, I think it has to be both, but I was pretty stunned by adjusting for the things we can adjust for. It was in that first wave, it was 10 to 13 times higher if you were in a nursing home or had recently been in a nursing home. So early on, there was very clear cohorting nosocomial risk going on for sure. It did look, look like they started to really come down to being pretty close by the end there. So I think that's the larger effect uh, personally, but there probably is a little bit of both. Have you, uh, as you, you your state by state analyses and a lot of things COVID, we saw curves begin to uh, separate by state as it related to vaccination uptake by yeah. state, which often related yeah. to we voted for. Yeah. Uh, did you see that? That's a great question. Um, we didn't look at it, and I'll tell you why. We didn't look at it because we know that we can't track vaccination very well. We tried that. We tried that as a nationwide, and we know that we're missing them. They were happening in the dialysis facility. Everyone was just getting it. It wasn't being tracked very well. So when we did that, we saw rates way lower. We saw by the middle of 2021, we saw about 50% we could see in the claims mm -hmm. among Medicare, but we knew that the population was at about 90%. So we know we weren't catching it, but we could just infer by the rates in state differential mortality yes, or different right bill, exactly and we sort states. of quit when we realized that we couldn't track vaccines but i think that would be a really interesting but you haven't, you had, no we you haven't know but if I there's think, a red state blue state no but i think we could look um we yeah. actually have done some other analyses kind of not on this topic but we've looked at medicaid expansion states and not mm -hmm. yeah. um not with covid but with actual esrd incidents and we see some effects there that yeah. states that didn't expand yeah, you wonder whether 
even in states where there was a lot of pressure against vaccination, this mm -hmm. population who's already kind of yeah. embedded in medical care is seeing, yeah. the, the dialysis patient is seeing healthcare providers I, three times a week, whether there's a, there was less of a difference than you would see in the regular yeah. population. I love that idea. I think we should try to do that. I think we're gonna to need to think about what metric do we use for categorizing the states, um, you know, something concrete, but I, I love that idea because I think Just we should do that. Yeah. Co co investigator on the grants. Go. All right. Awesome. Uh, any other any other questions? Thank you so much. Really Thank interesting. You. Really appreciate it.